Hello and welcome to another Big Finish video. In this Big Finish video, I'll be reviewing the First Doctor Companion Chronicle box set. So we're going right back to the 1960s. With four stories, The Fields of Terror, The Cross the Darkened City, Bonfire of Vanities and The Plague of Dreams. Yeah, certainly an interesting set of stories. So without further ado, let's look at the presentation. For so for the cover, I have to say I absolutely adore this cover. We've got the First Doctor there looking very sleepy. Uh, we've got Vicky, Ben and Polly and a Dalek and we've got the player there and Stephen and a nice sort of starry uh, background with this fire, sort of a fiery background which is very nice. We've got the first Doctor banner there, the side and what the set includes, so a bit of bio on all four stories. So do feel free to pause if you want to know more about the stories. Taking a look at the booklet now, we have pictures of the cast members there who perform in this story along with some of the writers. There we've got advertisement for Doctor Who magazine and we have the cast list there and we have production And credits. the disc art is exactly the same for all four discs. The Fields of Terror. So the first story in this set we kick off with Vicky uh, with a story set in the French Revolution. So we have a sequel to The Reign of Terror and I will be honest I was pretty excited as I do enjoy The Reign of Terror. So we have an historical story to kick off this box set and I will be honest when I found out the writer was John Pritchard I knew it would be great as he wrote the best story from the second Doctor Companion Chronicle box set the best story for me which was The Mouthless Dead and one thing's for certain John Pritchard certainly knows how to create an atmosphere as this story I've got to say does have a great atmosphere and it is a nice play on a, his on a horror story as it is basically a psychological thriller Part 1. Uh, the first half of part 1 is very much world building uh, with it sort of creating that whole sort of lawless um, world um, because obviously the Reign of Terror was set in Paris so we're going into sort of the countryside to see how the French Revolution sort of affected people in the country um, and John Pritchard like I said creates this great atmosphere with creating this cold harsh wintry environment with death and destruction created from the Fr French soldiers and the way the soldiers are described being these tortured and haunted faces and dead behind the eyes is just great so that's very much the first half of this part you know you're introduced to the monsters to the monster what is the French soldiers burning and destroying everything in their path but the second half of part one is where we're introduced to this monster plot and this is when tension really starts to come into play and the whole sort of psychological side of the story comes into it with this mysterious sort of hooded figure and I will say the cliffhanger is pretty traditional for this story. Part 2 continues this great mystery with the whole sort of threat. You know, what is this threat? What is this monster? What is this hooded figure? And it's quite interesting to see the tables turn with this house fire where the French soldiers are staying and the Doctor and gang. Um, because obviously the French soldiers are destroying everything that they awake because they're trying to restore order in their eyes. So it's very interesting to see them being the ones put in, out in the open in this whole danger of this hooded figure and people being killed in the dead of night so it's very interesting and this is when the story really starts to play on the horror element as we're introduced to folklore and like I said the monster within this story though it's technically not a monster it is a very clever uh, way of storytelling it's a very clever twist within the story and like I said it's very well done and the story does link to the start of how the story began so it's very nice that the story did become full circle characters the first doctor played by Maureen O'Brien now Maureen O'Brien does a brilliant job bringing the first doctor to life really capturing the fun side of Hartnell that sort of twinkle of mischief what he had towards the later run of his stories and Maureen O'Brien really captures all sort of the rhythm of how Hartnell would deliver, deliver the lines and I think that you know John Pritchard did a brilliant job because he just captured the essence of Hartnell's doctor from the grandfather figure in part two to challenging people and he does have this war machines moment when he's sort of confronting the French army where they're marching towards him and he's just there standing there clutching his lapels. It's such a brilliant moment and it's such a great image in your head just seeing Hartnell being all defiant and standing up against this whole sort of French army. It is absolutely brilliant. Um, so we do have that sort of authoritative side but he does become quite a diplomatic figure um, as the story progresses and obviously the classic sternness of the Hartnell, Hartnell's Doctor. Um, and I don't know if Maureen O'Brien did this or John Pritchard did it in the script work, but we have sort of the first Doctor sort of stuttering and, and stumbling on his lines, which is a nice little touch really. Um, whoever put it in the script or Maureen O'Brien did it, it was a nice little touch and it really added 
more and you really felt like it was a true first Doctor adventure. Vicky, Maureen O'Brien, this is a fantastic story for her, as you would expect, as she is the main focus, seeing these events through her eyes. And we do see her medical skills being used and her caring nature really explored within this story. And great character moments um, with, you know, in this story with Stephen and Nicole. And we do get um, to see Vicky at her most vulnerable, I guess. And Maureen O'Brien does a Stephen, great Stephen, again job. played by Maureen O'Brien. I will be honest, Stephen is pretty much pushed aside within this story. But we do get to see his protective side and his pilot skills used in the first half of the story. And he does get the odd action bit as well. But uh, yeah, Stephen is very much sort of pushed aside within this Captain story. Captain Lagrange, played by Robert Hand. What a nasty piece of work he is, you know, he's this stone cold smug character who is just downright horrible with no mercy and you know he thinks that he's all high and mighty, you know, he's doing no wrong, he's only restoring order to France. And Robert Hans just did a great job uh, with bringing this character to life with great confrontation scenes with the TARDIS crew. So what are my overall thoughts on the Fields of Terror? Well the Fields of Terror really encapsulate a historical story where the first 15 minutes you know what tone this story is gonna be and if you aren't a fan of historical stories then you get this monster plot thrown in so this story has something for everyone to enjoy so if you love history you'll enjoy that side of it if you love Doctor Who and monsters you'll love that side of the story so this story really has something for everyone and it offers something for everyone like I said um, but yeah I, I really do enjoy um, this story because it's a great play on a horror story. Although the story is more of a psychological thriller, um, you know, we have great characters, and I'm just surprised how much I enjoyed this one. And if I was to be really nitpicky, I would have liked to have seen Stephen more involved in the story, and perhaps, you know, if Stephen was more involved in the story, get Peter Purvis involved. Um, but that's me being rather nitpicky and I can't really complain because of the Stephen story which I'm about to review in a minute. So overall I think that this is a great addition to the historical lineup and I'm going to give this story an 8.5 out of 10. Across the darkened city, can we appreciate of what a 60s title that is? Now this was my most anticipated story from the set where we see Stephen form an unlikely alliance with a Dalek. So the story is a two-hander with Stephen and a Dalek. And personally, the best First Doctor audios you can experience, I find, are the Stephen, the Peter Purvis audios. I mean, last year's early adventures, the Series 3 ones, you know, uh, the Fifth Traveller and the Age of Endurance, they're a bit ropey, but then you hit the Ravelli Conspiracy and the Sontarans, they were just superb. And that's kind of the same with the other First Doctor Companion Chronicles. Don't get me wrong, there are some brilliant ones, but I just personally prefer the Peter Purvis ones. Um, and I had even higher expectations when I spoke to Peter Purvis about this story um, at a Comic-Con. Um, and I will be honest, I've been wanting a First Doctor Dalek story on Big Finish for a while, as they are Hartnell's defining monster. And I think that this is the first Dalek story the First Doctor has had on audio. I may be wrong, um, but this story is already ticking boxes for me. Part one, we are thrown right into the story, which can be a bold move throwing you straight into the story as we see Stephen on board a Dalek shuttle who is prisoner. And within those first five minutes, you know that these Daleks aren't taking any chances. They are just utterly ruthless, exterminating people on sight. And that's pretty much how the story kicks start. Yeah, pretty explosive way, I must add. Um, and we see Stephen become the sort of action hero with him sort of coming up with a plan to try and stop the Daleks with him crashing the ship, causing everybody to die except Stephen and this Dalek. And that's pretty much the premise of the story, whether Stephen and the Dalek have to work to get off this planet. Um, now, basically, uh, like the previous story, this story is oozing uh, with atmosphere, like literally everywhere. This planet they have landed on literally has no light. It is in constant darkness. So we have this desolate world, which really adds to the bleakness of this story with no hope of escaping this planet. And we just have this great imagery of Stephen pulling this Dalek around on this cart and we realise that the Daleks have history on this planet which really does fit the 1960s Daleks because they're all conquering and destroying everything. You know, just look at the 60s comics, what the Daleks featured in. And, we, you know, it does raise questions, this story does with, you know, what are the Kaons and the cliffhanger? Well, it's got to be one of the bleakest cliffhangers I have experienced on Big Fish. Part 2. This story keeps finding more ways of becoming more bleak with some cracking tense moments scattered throughout this part really showing the horrors of the Daleks with this mass grave what the Stephen and the Dalek have to go by and just the way the bodies are described just sends shivers down anyone's spine 
and you know we sort of see Stephen in part one moving dead bodies away to escape the ship so all that's sort of been building up in Stephen's mind the sort of thought of moving dead bodies to get off the ship and then seeing this mass grave you know it leads to this great confrontation between Stephen and the Dalek with you know Stephen questioning what legacy do the Daleks leave behind them uh, you know and it expands more on the Dalek what Stephen's with you know um, Dalek 210 and the last 20 minutes are just so tense and utterly gripping you know full of action and you're just gonna want to listen to once the credits are finished there is a nice little bonus scene uh, revealing what happens to 210 once he gets back um, so yeah that is very exciting that bit and it does link in with another 1960s Dalek story. Stephen played by Peter Purvis now what a story this is for Stephen you know seeing how Stephen deals with being put into these tight um, tricky situations that we see his action side and a whole range of emotions from guilt to sheer desperation and determination to get off this world. And most of all, he just wants respect from the Dalek. And, and this story really does sort of haunt Stephen, you know, from the events from moving dead bodies to seeing this mass grave and just seeing what sort of destruction and death the Daleks cause. It's just utterly, you know, tragic for Stephen and he's just really shaken up by this. And us knowing, um, you know, us the audience knowing what happens to Stephen, knowing that he has to face the Daleks again, is just utterly terrifying. And you just can't help but feel sorry for Stephen, knowing that he's got to face the Daleks again in the Daleks' master plan. And, you know, this story really does show what a fantastic character Stephen is. And Peter Purvis brings all these aspects to Dalek life. Dalek 210, played by Nicholas Briggs. A very interesting Dalek. Quite a typical 60s Dalek of being manipulative. But at the same time can be very different, you know, with him questioning orders and I guess he kind of acts like a sat nav. So if you ever wondered what a Dalek would be like as a sat nav, then now's your chance because this story kind of has that within it. Um, yes, as he's sort of guiding Stephen through this city. And the reveal at the end, and you real you sort of realise what 210 actually is and his fate, it's just utterly amazing and it just I call it fan pleasing. But it is definitely a very interesting ending for 210. So what are my overall thoughts on Across the Darkened City? Overall, I think that this is the type of story why the Companion Chronicles are made, as this story solely focuses on Stephen with narration, uh, within this really aiding to the story, you know, building the world and creating more of an atmosphere. And it's just a very clever two-hander seeing Stephen and the Starlick who are just totally against working with each other to escape. You know, but they do find the common ground of survival. And it is a brilliant story, uh, full of action and tense moments and beautifully told. And it really does feel like a 60s story. So I'm going to give this story a 9.5 out of 10. A very clever story. And yeah, like I said, this is a story showing why the Companion Chronicles are made, focusing solely on one character. The Bonfire of Vanities. Now this is very much a bonfire and Halloween story all thrown into one and it works extremely well. Now you may be thinking Ben and Polly and the First Doctor, how does that work? As the War Machines does sort of follow straight into the Smugglers and the Smugglers leads directly into the 10th planet. Now the first scene within the story is we do see the TARDIS materialise in the South Pole. Um, but all will be explained as each story up until this point has this strange glitch going on within the story. And, you know, one minute the TARDIS is in the South Pole in 1986, the next it's in 1950s. And I will be honest, I'm glad that we're getting more First Doctor, Ben and Polly stories, as they don't really have that many stories together. Um, so it's quite nice to see a few more, as I think, you know, they only had 10 little aliens in book form, and maybe the odd short trip, but I think that it's nice that Ben and Polly are finally getting some audio adventures. Part one, like I said, we hear the TARDIS materialise in the South Pole and we do get a nice recreation of the opening scene in the TARDIS of Polly getting the Doctor's cloak. And then we're straight into this story and Una McCormack paints a beautiful landscape helping give this sort of wintry and cold feel across the town. And what helps that even more so is the Doctor is portrayed as ill and frail which really does fit the continuity if you're a continuity buff like that. So Ben and Polly do get a fair bit to do within this story. And no, this story isn't really Dr. Light. Um, we have this great animosity in the town as everyone, you know, is very much balancing on a knife edge, you know, with the force of bonfire boys. And we do explore the town's history with those events coming back to haunt the town. And that's essentially the premise of this story. And the story also, you know, questions a race, you know, who is Gamble? 
and we see one of the threats of the guys and I will say they are quite creepy and the way they're described and the sound design for them is just eerie and just the haunting screams and the last eight minutes you know the story really starts to become more eerie and it also starts the sort of base under siege plot Part 2, chaos is unleashed across the town with a massive explosion and the bonfire boys causing havoc across the town. With great imagery with the sky on fire and we see Gamble enter the ring and we see the doctor gathered strength confronting the town full of great speeches and I will say the alien subplot within the story I found a bit unnecessary as I felt like it was just to push and pad out the last 10 minutes of the story. But really, other than that, I would say the ending is just rather nice and quite heartwarming and it is a nice winter's tale. Characters. The Doctor played by Annika Wills. Like I said, we see the Doctor ill and frail and, you know, him needing support. So we see him walking around the town with him clutching Ben and Polly. Um, you know, but there is a lovely warmth and, you know, charm to the Doctor with him showing his caring nature and concern for the town. Um, but once he's gathered his strength, you know, he's a true force to be reckoned with, you know, him taking no nonsense with his you know, great authority and I love the description you know Polly says you know he's like a headmaster of the force of the cane behind him and I just love that when he's talking to the town you know that he feels like a headmaster figure you know with the whole force of the cane behind his voice so I just love that um, description for him and you know despite him being ill you know you know he's quite impatient and you know he still wants to go out and assess the situation and it's just, I love the speeches the first Doctor has given and Annika Wills just does a marvellous Polly, job. Annika Wills. Now, Polly has a fair bit to do within the story, you know, her researching about the town, trying to find weaknesses in the loop of the town's history. And her just being this rather lovely, warm, bubbly character, you know, concerned for the Doctor's health and her caring nature with her, caring after the Doctor and the joy of her being back on Earth and her being quite anxious about the events ac happening across ben, the town. Ben, Elliot Chapman. Wow, it shocks me every time I hear him play Ben, uh, you know, it is just uncanny. If he wasn't credited on the box set, you know, Elliot Chapman, I would think Big Finish had the ability to resurrect people. Now, Ben does get a few um, great witty lines and some nice moments standing up against the bonfire boys, you know, he's very protective, but in part two, Ben really comes into his own with some great fantastic moments. We see him take care of the first Doctor, and we hear Elliot Chapman do his first Doctor voice which was great to hear and you know he does sound like Hartnell with the different inflections of his voice and it's just quite a nice addition to hear somebody else do the first Doctor voice and it's quite nice to hear Eric Chapman's sort of take on the first Doctor. Then we have the librarian character Mary Wilson played by um, Annika Wills and I guess Elliot Chapman to an extent you know a very supportive and welcoming character and can be quite cheeky and get some great interactions with Polly in part two and some great little lovely moments and then we have Gamble, again played by Annika Wills and Elliot Chapman, you know, your typical tough guy with power and control over the bonfire boys and just a well played character um, by those two people. Overall, the Bonfire of Vanities is a perfect winter listen with a chilly feel to it, but also a warm and cosy feel to it as well. A perfect mix of scares from Halloween and the explosive side from Bonfire Night. A clever story with great characters and wonderful performances and I will say I did enjoy it more on re-listen. And I will say the location for this, you know, is well fleshed out with us getting the history of the location and it linking to the actual plot. Though I will say my main criticism is the alien subplot. I found it a bit unnecessary and just came out of the blue. Um, and I love the sort of bit of base under siegeness of the story with, or should I say, library under siege. I thought that was a nice little thing. And a nice balance of mixing locations. Um, so yeah, that was quite nice. And I can picture this story vividly um, with the mix of location and studio filming it does feel very 60 so overall i'm gonna give the bonfire of vanities a 8 out of 10. the plague of dreams okay this is one interesting story a very unique concept by guy adams and this story can only be done as a companion chronicle and on audio as this story really pushes the companion chronicles in a new direction and dare i say it is quite a groundbreaking story in that regard as it does utilise the two actors extremely well, as it is done as a two-act play. Part 1. Where to start? Well, I'm going to start with the structure for this story, as it is very creative, as this story is done as a play, with Polly and the player telling this story. So, the more you buy into this play, the more real the props and the sets become. Um, so, I guess, you know, this story does have a bit of um, breaking the fourth wall, you know, saying things like, you know, the audience isn't there, they can only hear you. 
and the plague concept within this story is very refreshing because it's not like your typical black death plague you know it's quite um, refreshing in that sense of that you know when you're dreaming you know your dreams become reality and let's say that the dreams aren't rather pleasant they're more nightmares um, so you get these all manner of crazy creatures happening all over this village once people are taken over by this sleepy plague and we do get some very interesting things happen within this part as well you know how does the doctor recognize a player what is this war going on and we see the first doctor start the regeneration process as he's been pushing his body a bit too much recently part two i've got to say it is a clever way of how they get around the cliffhanger and i will say that this is more of an engaging part to listen to as you know we see the dream start to cause havoc and we hear creatures from adventures what we've never seen before so this is a lot more exciting than part one and you know we much you know because part one is very much sort of the setup part as you would expect um so this story does take more of a fairy tale and fantasy-esque side to it and it does lead directly into the tenth planet and this part does explain those weird glitches what have been happening throughout the previous three stories um so i guess the, you know the box that does have a mini arc Characters, like I said, this story can only be done with two performers or you would lose the charm of this story. Um, so you have the player and Polly getting to play all manner of things from pirates to steam powered robots. Um, so the Doctor, now this story really adds nobility to him as, you know, as much as the Tenth Plant is a great story, it's not really a send off for the first Doctor. So this story really shows his curious nature by the plague and being fascinated, um, but he can be a bit grumpy and crotchety. And what I love um, is when he goes off and does a scientific explanation, but it's told from Polly's point of view. So when Polly's playing the Doctor, you get stuff like, um, you know, oh, it was a psychic attack, blah, 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 blah. Um, because Polly doesn't understand it, so it's done in Polly's perspective because obviously she's playing the first Doctor. Polly, played by Annika Wills. I just love her whole bewildered state throughout episode one with her trying to come to terms with this reality and her being quite impressed by the sets and props as obviously the more you believe, the more real they become. Um, and we see Polly more vulnerable as we see her and just the player telling the story. So you know, she's got no comfort of the Doctor being there. So it's quite interesting to see Polly put in that situation. And Annika Wills does a brilliant job. Uh, the player, played by Elliot Chapman, um, a character who's quite Shakespearean and you do get Shakespeare being quoted within this part. You know, he's very much the person guiding the story along, you know, the character who does break the fourth wall and fourth wall and does take the mick out of the story sort of structure and we do get a funny bit about continuity and that's all i'm willing to say about him because you know he, he does get a great character reveal um and it's quite unexpected so that's all i'm going to say on the player. overall the plague of dreams is a fun and clever story pushing the framework of a companion chronicle granted it may take a while for you to get into the story um but that's like most plays it takes a while for the story to get going um performance wise it's great. Annika Wills and Elliot Chapman are given a lot to sink their teeth into, full of dramatic moments and a few laughs along the way and a rather touching ending knowing the first Doctor is off to the South Pole. Um, you know, this story is solely designed for the audio medium and it's just beautifully executed by everyone involved with this story. So I'm going to give The Plague of Dreams a 9 out of 10, a brilliant, clever story pushing the boundaries of the Companion Chronicles. So overall, what do I think of the First Doctor Companion Chronicle box set volume 2? Well, I think it encapsulates everything about the First Doctor era. You know, you've got the historical story, you've got the far out space adventure, you've got the contemporary Earth story, what was first noted in the War Machines, and then you've got the creative and imaginative story in the fourth story. And that, you know, the fourth story just sums up 60s Who, creative and imaginative, because that's what 60s Who is, creative and full of imagination. And like I said, it just sums up the Hartnell era brilliantly. Each story has something to offer for each fan, um, whether it be you know, your sci-fi, your historical, or you just fancy something off the wall. It is just beautifully crafted. Everyone within this box that does a marvellous job. And like I said, it is a perfect tribute to the Hartnell era and it sums up everything what I love about the Hartnell era. From the far out space adventure, to the odd historical story, to the start of the contemporary uh, Earth stories, and of course, the full creative and imaginative scope what 60s Who had. Because this box set, dare I say, it, is quite groundbreaking for Big Finish. As you know, we see a two-hander with Steven and a Dalek, and we see the Companion Chronicle format really pushed, you know, the framework of a Companion Chronicle being twisted and manipulated 
and seeing how far they can push that format. So it is brilliantly done. And overall, this box set gets an 8.7 out of 10. A very strong release. And when I do my recommendation from 2017 Big Finish, this is probably going to be on the list because I absolutely adore this box set. So thank you very much for watching this review. I hope you have enjoyed it and I'll see you in my next video, whatever that will be. So thank you very much and goodbye.